Uh, before I start my chat with, uh, with Dennis, I, I just wanted to say a word or two about what we just heard before the break. Uh, I thought that Ealing and Breeze's contribution to this conversation was, was powerful. Uh, I see Ealing just about to sit down and... Ealing, you, you used that term about knowing your place. Uh, and, and I know exactly what you were saying. But the place for someone who has suffered so much in this conflict should be center stage and to be heard. And, and I think that that was important in today's conversation. The same with you, Breach. And, you know, in the course of this process, there are moments and conversations that happen that if you said to me, 15, 20, 10 years ago, that just happened, or that might happen, you would say to yourself, it's not possible. And I just thought that that session before the break was, was one of those moments, important moments, when people, not who should know their place, but who deserve to be heard, were heard, but I think not just heard, but listened to. And, and I'm sure it was something that struck you Dennis, as we, as we listen. Well, a lot of things struck me when, when listening to you and Breach. Uh, in fact, a lot of memories came back. Anyways, um, I think I have been trying to push a lot of these memories away in the last period of time. Uh, I haven't talked a lot about the past for quite some time, and I, I looked at the new legislation recently, and I found myself not wanting to read it. And I found myself been almost emotionally disturbed, not by reading it, but by the fact that I might have to read it mm. because I didn't want to read it. Mm. Um, but some of the some of the memories are are, are important memories. Um, I remember a night in Cookstown when I sat with a group of me and others sat with a group of people who had been in the UDR and um, all of them had people who had been killed within that, and I think it was myself or someone else asked the question, well, there was quite a bit of anger in the room. Well, what would you do, and um, what would you want us to do? And what can we do for you? And one man said, and this really resonated with me, was he said, uh, well, you could, the only, you can do, he started by saying you can do nothing for us. And then he thought for a second, he says, yeah, there's perhaps one thing. He says you could get the Republicans or ARA to uh, say that they would never kill any of us again for political reasons. And that's resonated with me and has always resonated with me since. Um, I think that the one thing that the ARA should do is tell the unionist people that they will never kill them again for political reasons. I think that's a very big contribution. Um, I, remember meeting the Valley Murphy people and reading, I thought that the, I was a big supporter of the HET, I'm still a big supporter of the HET, I think it was a, it was a effort, the historical inquiries team which was looking and trying to work with families, set up by Hugh Ord, I think it was a, it was an effort, it wasn't a complete effort, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a total approach to the past, but it was at least an interim effort. So I was a supporter of the HET, and I remember the Valley uh, Lane Murphy people coming in, and I had to read the reports that the HET had done for them and been shocked by how bad the reports were, uh, how incomplete they were, because they took almost each individual case as if it happened somewhere totally separate from the actual three days. So even the effort that we made in the past, which had integrity, uh, which I think we're trying to get at some kind of truth. So all of that just proves, and I don't want to get into it unless you want me to go into mm. it, right? Because this is a major and difficult and complex subject matter, and you can wander down roads and you realize that having wandered down that road that you missed the main road. Mm. Um, and in fact, there probably isn't any main road. There's a series of roads which you actually have to consider. And to be very fair, I, I would have to say this too, and I think, I think 
in the Bally Murphy case, the Bally Murphy case is interesting that, that Breed says that they now feel better, and I can fully understand that from the uh, coroner's court, or from the, sorry, from the inquiry. The difficulty, of course, is that that doesn't get you to the thing which is called justice. And of course, that didn't happen either within the, um, within the Bloody Sunday mm. Savile Inquiry. It got a recommendation, but then we had a full police inquiry which followed that, and then we had recommendations coming out of that, and then we had the, PPP, the PPS's office coming out of that. So this is difficult terrain. Uh, and I don't think that there are any simple silver no. bullets, and there's no simple answers. Um, the other thing, of course, is that I think that sometimes we have to remember, and this is a harsh thing to say, and I've said it a few times, so I'm, I'm not going to run away from it. Um, we cannot always, in the, in the aftermath, society cannot always, in the aftermath, give to the real victims of tragedy and war and violence the things that they need and the things that they desire. Uh, that's not going to happen in Bosnia. It's mm. not going to happen in, in Ukraine. It's not going to happen. Uh, and the best that society can do is do the best. But the thing that I think that used to make me most angry around having done a wide cons consultation was when government said to people, and Breed mentioned this, I think it was Breed mentioned this, that when government said to people, we will leave no stone unturned. It, it was it was Ealing or Ailing, who, who sorry, then said Ailing. that they cemented the stone yeah, stone. I, yeah. um, I mean, I used to get quite angry around that because I knew that was not true. Mm. The governments are not capable of that, and they're unlikely to do it with the, with the passage of time. Um, so they should, it should never have come out of a politician's mouth, mm. right, that we will leave no stone unturned. Mm. Uh, anyway, sorry, go on, yeah. wander down that side. Road. No, no, um, I think what we'll try to do in this session, Dennis, is make it as conversational as, as possible so that we'll talk with each other rather than, than, than sure. at each other. Um, I suppose what Dennis brings to this conversation is an experience that stretches right across the conflict frame into, into the here and now from Bloody Sunday, to the secret dialogue between the British government and the IRA with Dennis and a couple of other men from a city in the middle trying to link them up in a, in a conversation which was about trying to achieve peace, onto the policing board when the RUC became the, the PSNI and we, we began this journey, what's called new policing. And 15 years ago, I was just thinking about that today, 15 years ago, the government appointed the Eames-Bradley Consultative Group. And I suppose where I'd like to start with you, Dennis, is 15 years ago, did you think in 2022 we'd be going backwards rather than making some progress? It doesn't totally surprise me, actually. And when you ask that question, this comes back to me. Um, I was terrified and almost very negative uh, about going into this process at all mm. and would have been easily persuaded that it wasn't doable mm. and perhaps even that it shouldn't be done. And then I heard one morning driving along a road, I heard a report, I think it was on BBC Radio 4 in the morning, out of Spain that uh, they were having trouble in Spain around their, their, their war mm -hmm. 40 years afterwards. Their history. Their history. And I think at that stage I began to think, well, we could end up in, that, in a similar type of situation. Um, so I, I'm not totally surprised in that I'm not, not too sure that there are that many examples internationally of resolution, of repair, uh, of reconciliation. Uh, of processes that deliver. Mm. I'm not con fully convinced that that happens. But what I am convinced about is that I think that there's an obligation on us to try. Mm. I think there's an obligation on us to be, to be responsive in that way for, on behalf of the victims, but also on behalf of ourselves. Uh, 
even though I say that I don't think the U Ukraine will have a, 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 any kind of response in, the, in that sense, apart from maybe a few trials about uh, war crimes, I think that there is a, resp a, a response, or sorry, a, a responsibility on the community for their own sake as well as those who have died to actually have some type of reflection and response where response is possible to actually address, I mean, one of the, one of the deadly things about life, which is that violence creates mayhem and that that mayhem leads to death and that death is so final uh, and cannot be repaired. But what can happen in, in some ways is some kind of reflection upon it, some kind of learning from it, some type of understanding that deepen, deepens our humanity. Mm. Uh, and all of those things, I think, can come out of the past, uh, but they're not easy. You, you mentioned uh, in your opening comments what you thought the IRA should do. And despite the fact that we have been down this road, or one of those roads that you mentioned, for 15 years and more, I think one of the things that is absent from any process is the conversation across the sides, IRA, loyalist, uh, military, uh, security, police, intelligence, the media, churches, the many other players, about what an information process or a truth process might deliver. I mean, the, the impression I have of the UK legislation is that they're building a house that no one's going to buy. And that in many senses, we've got the, the cart in front of the, the horse. That, that we talk about these processes of truth. We talk about these processes of information retrieval. And we have no idea from those who we expect to deliver the information what it is they may bring forward? Well, that's a very important question, and, and it's not an e there's no easy answer to it, but let me just make a few comments upon it. Uh, sometimes the difficulty about dealing with the past is that people sometimes want individual cases dealt with, their own cases or their own community's interpretation mm. of our history dealt with. But it's when you come to the totality of it that it becomes very difficult. If it could remain at the individual level that you could say, well, let's go down that road and we can solve that problem, mm. or what, we can't solve it, but we can at least address it with some integrity. But once you bring it into the totality of a divided situation, which, which came out of a divided situation, mm -hmm. which was made complex and which was made uh, violent by a divided situation, then not alone are you dealing with the results of that, you're dealing with the individual uh, and, and the generational effects of all of that. And that makes it even more complex. So you're not just dealing with a single sheet, you're dealing with, a, with multiple sheets w w within that. And you're dealing with multiple and complex histories. Mm. So all of that gets, gets wrapped into it. Uh, the difficulty, I think, with this, my, without having read it in, made in, in, in any great depth, this bill that is going through at the moment is, is geared at one particular group, which is the Conservative Party, trying to find a way out for the veterans. And if the minute you do that, then you come up with something which is incomplete within itself. And the real question that Julian Smith, for example, just using him because mm -hmm. he was on the screen this morning, a man of great integrity, I think, who within a short period of time did make us feel that somebody was coming at this with, with a new eye and with a new heart. That they cared. That they cared about it. Uh, and then we lost that mm. very quickly. But for that very the, reason, probably. Yeah, well, for that very reason, right? And I told him four days beforehand that there was no way the Prime Minister would get rid of him. It shows you <laughs> how good the <laughs> actor I am, right? Yeah, sell uh, that crystal ball, yeah, will yeah. you? Um, so uh, it's good to be humble at times, <laughs> right? Um, anyway, I was. Now you threw me off my, my, my train of thought. Um, yes, the difficulty with Julian Smith has, and people like that, is. This word mitigate. 
do they mitigate this bill or do they reject this bill? Mm. And that's a question in some ways for everybody, so it's not an easy answer. I don't think this bill is scalable, mm. right? So I don't think it's really a big, it's, it's, it's the most difficult of, of, of responses to that. I suppose, and you know, I've, I've had this thought for, for many years that throughout this process, at its most difficult moments, we have needed help from outside of us. So we brought George Mitchell in to deal with the politics of the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement. We brought Chris Patton in to deal with the, the policing reform. We didn't ask Chris Patton to achieve a five-party political consensus. And if we had, we'd still have the RUC today, I would have thought. And then we brought General de Chastelin in to deal with the arms issue. And yet, on the two most important questions facing us, both our our past and our present and our future. We think we can do this ourselves. Uh, and I think we're kidding people with all of that. We're, we're too small a place. We're all emotionally attached to the last 40 or 50 years. We're stitched into the fabric of this place. And I was just saying to David um, during the interval um, that I think we need pens free of emotional link to write the story of this place. Because there will never be one story or one truth. And, you know, we all listen to Ealing and Breach. They will, they will come at this from two different perspectives. But they're able to hear each other. And maybe that is the missing piece in our piece. That we haven't listened to people enough. Well, if you boil that down into the realities of the situation, I have become a believer over the years and that uh, things only work here when the two governments are in both, mm -hmm. and when the two governments work, work, mm -hmm. work, work together. Um, and I think that a mistake was made at the very early days uh, of even the consultant group in the past, the Ames Bradley situation, uh, because the Irish government didn't come on board. Now, take some responsibility for that myself because I pleaded with the Irish government to come on board and failed to convince them. Mm. Um, but went ahead despite my misgiving that this could work without the Irish government. And I think I was proved to be wrong. So I think that the part, apart from the bill, for example, at the moment, mm. and apart from everything else, uh, I will quote Gregory Campbell here at the moment. Gregory always talks, talks about the important to remember the context, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and the context, of course, of all of this is that the two governments have never been further apart. Mm. And we are in a bad, not be, I'm not too worried about the executive being up and running mm. or the assembly being up and running. I would prefer they, they were. Mm. But I am very worried about the fact that the governments are, are so far apart. Miles apart. Yeah, that really disturbs me. I think that undermines the foundational safety that, that the Anglo-Irish Agreement provides for us. Uh, and I think that uh, I spent three days in, in Oxford this year at the British Irish Association, and I observed the body language of the Irish government, very senior people there, and I observed the body language and the words of the British government with very senior people there. And it is quite clear that the Irish have tried incredibly hard mm. to be decent, to be honorable within the situation. And my observation, whether people that agree with it or not, is that this British, present British government are nigh impossible to work with. Uh, I'll raise one other point just before we open the conversation. I've, um, I've spoken many times about how we, and, and I include myself, and I include you in this, and many of the people in the room, we as the conflict generation, pour our experiences uh, and our thinking on top of the generations that follow us. And I remember uh, speaking at an event in my hometown, Hollywood, with Derek Henderson of the Press Association. Derek with Ivan Little had just published this book, Reporting the Troubles, where they'd asked 60 or so journalists to make a, to make a contribution to it. 
And at that event, I said that if we're not careful, we're going to bury ourselves in the conflict period, and we're going to bury the next generations in the conflict period. And I went home that night and got up for a glass of water during the night, flicked on my phone, and learned that Lyra McKee had been shot dead in Derry, and started to think then about the damage that we're doing to those generations that follow us. Not just Lyra McKee's death, but whoever sent a young lad out with a gun to fire shots at the, uh, at the police in Derry that night. And I wonder what you think about that, that damage in waiting. Dennis, you know, the, the longer we wait, the more damage we do. I don't have a complete or, or, or great insight into that, but if I'm being fully honest, my fear is that the that the victims, the, those people who have had people directly killed, as opposed to the bigger victim society of trauma and memory and all that type of stuff, but those who really feel personalized and in a personal position around this, and can't let it go and don't want to let it go and feel it's not their, their place to let it go. And it isn't, by the way, in many mm -hmm. ways. Some other people have decided that they will let it go. Mm -hmm. So there's, there, there, there's many responses to that as well. But my fear is that society will let it go. And I'm not fully convinced that the past is strong enough any longer. I, I maybe thought this once. I'm not convinced anymore that the past is strong enough to affect our future politics. Mm. I think what is more likely to happen is that our future politics will find its way, stumble its way, uh, kind of awkwardly, clumsily, but will stumble its way through to some type of future, mm. and that the victims will be left behind, mm. feeling very angry and very dissatisfied. And I think those who are predicting that this may be the last chance saloon, mm -hmm. which is the present bill, are kind of being drawn into a situation which in which they're saying, well, if we don't, those who, who are maybe even against the bill are saying, well, if we don't go with this, there's going to be nowhere else. Yeah, there's nothing right? else. There's nothing else. So I think there's a danger in that. Um, I didn't answer your question, and it's kind of pertinent to this, about the ex extra external as opposed to the internal mm. processes. That, I mean, the consultative group in the past were very strong on 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 a number of things, but particularly on the governance of the processes that were going to be set up. Your legacy commission, your yeah. investigative. And the legacy commission were three mm. people, mm. right? I, ha I mean, Stormont House basically is a, is a version of, of the consultative group in the past. You invented the wheel, so well, it's the investigation. The wheel was, yeah, but the difficulty with Stormont House was that there was about 30 people managing Mm. if not 300 people, because all the people had to have their say, mm. all the political parties, and that's where I blame the governments. Mm -hmm. I mean, the day that we proposed three, I was beginning to wonder that three were too many. Mm -hmm. Because the more people you put in charge of that type of situation, the more you're opening yourself to, to, to all kinds of discussion. You're creating so a debating society in many senses. Complexity yeah. becomes yeah. three is, is enough, right? Yeah. The second question, which I think is very important, there's a part of that which I think I totally agree with. It's not that we can't do it, but that we need, I think, two things to do it. One is a bit of a distance, and you can't create distance in the, in the smallest society as this. And the second is what I would call stature or authority. And I'm not too sure a judge does this. Mm. I think you're talking about someone of major political standing who leads this. I think if you if you look and you listen to all the conversations, the real core difficulty in all of this is lack of trust. Mm. And every process that has failed has increased that lack of trust to where we're, there's no trust left. G give me just one moment. I know that Kenny and Ealing are heading to another engagement, and I, I just wondered before you leave, is there anything you would like to ask Dennis? Also the spot there at Yinbor. Sorry. I think, um, I think the point of the government, I suppose, premise of this bill around the issue of reconciliation 
And I think from certainly wide discussions we have within our own constituency, we don't believe reconciliation in its true sense is ever achievable in this society without an account of wrongdoing by all concerned. You can't not go through the hard grind in order to get to that holy grail of reconciliation. Not real reconciliation. We've had phony peace, we've had phony reconciliation. But for it to be a reconciliation with a foundation, durable, to withstand what could come at it in the future, that must require an account across the board, the good, the bad and the ugly. And I just would ask for your comment on that, that has any of the processes in the last 12, 15 years really been realistic around all of that? Or have we managed to, I suppose, convince ourselves that we can achieve that without the requirement for full accountability? Yuling, did you want to say some, something there? I saw you with the Just finger. kind of want to add on that thing about reconciliation. Um, I have never been consiled to be reconciled to any terrorists or anybody that is in, you know, security forces, etc., that has used their position in the wrong way. So there's not reconciliation there. And I don't want it to be reconciled to them until they have reconciled themselves to basic levels of decency. And I'm speaking as somebody who went and visited Sean O'Gallaghan in prison on the basis that he had completely renounced what he had done, etc. So they... So that's that they have to come to a certain point. I shouldn't have to move. Innocent victims should not have to move. We've given up, well, not that we've given a lot. Stuff has been taken from us, not that we have given it. Um, so they, those people have to come to the right place first. But the one place that there could be reconciliation is actually those people in governments, in positions of power who have responsibility for defending justice, et cetera, who have failed in their obligations and who are failing now. Because maybe I could be reconciled with them on the basis that at one time I might have believed in them. At one time I was naive enough to believe that people in those thing, went into those things for often the right reasons. So that's the two places of reconciliation where the, the powers that be need to be recon reconciled to us and terrorists, et cetera, and, use that have, and those that have misused their positions need to be reconciled to basic levels of decency and not being given a way of copping out of their responsibilities by governments that are too scared to stand up for what's right. Thank you. Dennis, the holy grail of reconciliation, then. Is it possible, or are we chasing an impossible dream? It's... A, it, it's it's probably a, a dream that is in, in need of being proven to be, to be made corporate more often than it actually happens. And I'm not just referring to Northern Ireland. Mm. I mean, reconciliation is a, it's a very big board with many, many definitions around it. What I mean by that is that in itself, it is a wonderful uh, Honourable. Well, it's a wonderful and honourable concept because it, it involves forgiveness and so forth. Is it achievable? Yes, it's achievable in a way, um, but not easily achievable. And I think that sometimes uh, it, 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 it's a kind of a stage thing. In the, in the report that we did in the consultative group in the past, there's actually a very interesting paragraph around some of this stuff, which talked about that you can change the past. And that's what we need to continue to believe, that you can change the past. What you cannot change is the facts of the past, that somebody was killed, that somebody was horribly killed, or people were killed, or this happened for this reason, and so forth. You can't change that. But the but change can, is not repeating you, it, is that what you mean? No, you? no, no, it's not that. The change is understanding that, that you can to use that old cliche, you can walk on other people's shoes, mm -hmm. that you can understand that this is a complex situation, that, that life is complex in its own right. Um, you know, the answer to, to some of this stuff, of course, is that government should... I remember, I remember being very struck 
by a unionist community I talked to one time who said that they really felt betrayed twice, the fact that their people were killed, and secondly, that they believed that the British government would never, ever give in in the sense of let people out of jail, mm. right? And then they did that. Uh, and I, I, I think that that is, I think your aliens referring to that to some degree, that reconciliation to your own governments and to your own politics is a very important part of this process. Uh, perhaps something that we don't examine often enough. Politics is very limited because we as people allow it to be limited. We as people allow it always to be a compromising situation. Now, the truth of the matter is 90% of the time Politics is compromise. It's compromise between two parties. It's compromise between two extremes. It's compromise between this and that. Peace is a compromise. And peace, quite often, no, the impl not peace is not compromise. The the, the 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 implementation of the of the mechanisms to achieve peace is very often a compromise. But peace itself should never be a compromise, because peace, in some ways should come dropping by and should be part of life and should be part of the way in which we actually try to, to live our lives. But I'm trying to drive at something which I think is a very, we have to, we can change the past because when people tell each other, and this is the important thing of what you, what you observed here in the stage this morning, when people tell each other their stories, it is much more difficult to actually be still angry, to be still as full up as, or pent up with stuff, right? And the reason, by the way, the Anglo-Irish agreement is so important is because those are the two stories. And those are the, those are the now, those are the residue now, those are the, the actors who actually incorporate the two stories, the British and the Irish story. And we need to reconcile the British and the Irish story as part of the past. And we're not working at it at the moment. We're drawing away from it at the moment, and therefore we're creating this type of bill which is happening with the Irish kind of saying, no, 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 we're not having it, this is terrible, and so forth. So our understanding of what reconciliation is, is in itself, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a full module of a course, right? <laughs> PhD, but it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an important one. It's a very, very important one. Sorry, I don't want to wander down the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just in terms of the, how we actually are divided or herded in this particular place, I mean, to this day, we're all told you're the tribe of Protestant Unionist Loyalist and they're the tribe of Catholic Nationalist Republican. And until we actually look beyond that particular herding, this issue ain't going to change. Because what you witnessed on the stage this morning in terms of Alien and Bridge that's not unsurprising. The two of them are coming from a position of having been hurt as families, having had wrongs perpetrated against them. They're not the two people who need to reconcile with one another. They need to reckon, they need the people who harmed them to show humility, to show honor, to show openness, transparency, and integrity in how they deal with them. So how we divide in this place is not on the tribes, it's where you stand on the issue of violence. Do you use it? Do you justify it? Do you excuse it? Do you romanticize it? Or do you stand opposed to that violence and the use of it to pursue or defend a political objective? That's what I would say. But that's correct, but myself and Kenny have had this conversation before. The mm. difficulty is if I go into a room of where of the community the breach comes from, they will say, "But uh, you know, violence is used all over the place. British government used violence, army used violence, police used violence, IRA used violence, the loyalists used violence. There are no pa there. I mean, the, the thing that is missing mostly in Northern Ireland are pacifists. I, I grew I grew up in a church which has never created theology about about pacifists." I don't know any of our Christian churches, apart from the Quakers, who have a theology of, Christ, of, of pacifism. People say it's, it's, it's silly. 
People say, how could you use it? I mean, perfect example recently was Ukraine. A number of people who are non-violent people who said, let's get in there, fight. <laughs> let's take the Russians on. I mean, uh, there are, the last pacifists were taken out and shot uh, in, the, in, the, in the wars, in the world wars. This is, a, violence is a major, major problem mm -hmm. that we don't address, even at the, at the, Christian, at the Christian church level. Mm. Never mind at the political level. So it's very hard to blame politicians mm. when there is no theology. There, Pax Christi has recently come forward with a Pax Christi, a group of people who, 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 who were anti the bomb, and particularly the, you know, the atomic bombs, uh, who came out of Christian churches. In fact, the leader of it died recently. The leader in England died recently. Um, and they have talked about creating a, 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 a kind of uh, a peace theology, right? Because what, what the Catholic Church came up with was, uh, was the just war theory. I don't know if anybody knows the just war theory, but we ended up with cardinals going out and throwing holy water over tanks as we sent them into Vietnam, right? Britain is based on a whole legacy, a whole history of the worship of, of armies. I mean, I, I have a brother, brother-in-law who lives in England, who died recently, and he, was, he loved England, right? But he couldn't get over when he went to England that he lived with people who constantly talked about the Second World War. And there's this case of great worshiping of, of that history. Uh, and Ireland, of course, we grew up, those of us who come from an Iceland community, grew up on the Parry Piers of this world. Now, that's all part of whom we are. I'm all, all I'm saying to them, that is the response to it on the Christian side of it has been very negligible. Yeah. Uh, Kenny, I'll, I'll, I'll say this now. I, I just want to set the ailing as well uh, because it's, it's relevant to the ailing story. The first statement I took from the IRA was the day after the Innisfilling bomb. And in that statement, they described what they called a mistake. They claimed to have placed the bomb but claimed that the army had detonated it. I think there is justice and truth. And what the IRA should say as a starting point in all of this is that the Inniskillen bomb wasn't a mistake. That there was a calculation in all of those attacks, not just in Inniskillen, but in many others where, where civilians died. There is that calculation, that balance in war about collateral damage. So a beginning to truth about Inniskillen would be the IRA saying that they placed the bomb, they detonated the bomb, and that when they placed and detonated that bomb, they knew they were going to kill civilians. That would be a starting point and some meeting place for some conversation about truth. But the statement that was issued in 1987 is a lie on the record. Uh, that's what has to change. And I don't just mean that about the IRA, I mean that across our frame. That I think until, and that's what I meant about not knowing what people are going to bring to this conversation. If a truth process or an information retrieval process is the same story of an Askillin that we heard in 1987, then it is a waste of time. And that's why I think we need that person of international stature, international influence, to first of all have that conversation about what is achievable what is not achievable. And then we can determine as a community and communities whether this process is worth something or worth nothing. But the Inniskillen IRA statement is a lie, and it is a lie that has been on the record since 1987. I don't know if that helps answer your question or, or not, or, or doesn't help, but, but that, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Supposedly to murder a Catholic named Sean, purely mm -hmm. a sectarian murder. 
They murdered Adam in a case of mistaken identity. I think it was a workman's hut or something, was it? If, if I can remember it correctly. Sure. Can Both Adam's parents were in the UDR. And Ivy, when asked her initial interview afterwards, she said it wouldn't have mattered whether they murdered my son or Sean. It would equally have been wrong. Those are the people who are the real heroes and martyrs in this place. They need to start being held up as that. Okay, Kenny, thank you very much. Thank you, Yelling. Um, and, and thanks for your participation in the conference and in this conversation. Um, we're going to open it up now into a, a wider conversation. What time are we at, Dennis? No, it's quarter to. Quarter to. We've, we, we've, we've got 20, 30 minutes to, to continue this conversation. Do we, do we have a question from, from anywhere else? Don't be shy. Oh, here we are, we've got, we've, we've got some, so to, to, just waiting for the microphone here. Janet Donnelly, um, Balmacy Families. Um, as you know, we went through our inquest and we are where we are today. But as of today, the MOD still have not issued an apology to the families of the Balmacy Families. Um, they have asked, we've asked, them to issue a statement, but they won't apologise to the Balmarkey families. And as part of the British government, Boris Johnson did deliver, well, he got his secretary of state to make a half-baked apology, um, and that wasn't accepted. Mm. He apologised himself. But the MOD, as part of the British government, mm. and their people murdered our loved ones, and not of an apology, even though we have British soldiers starting up in court and saying it didn't matter what age you were, if you were on the street in Ballymurphy, you were not a legitimate target. Um, it was British soldiers said uh, that our first aiders, they were IRA first aiders, um, and this is stuff we had to listen to in court, um, among a whole lot of other things, um, but. We're never going to get an apology from the MOD. You, you might, I suppose. <laughs> you, you might, you know, because, uh, you know, as Breeze was saying earlier, you went into an inquest process, not not believing that you were going to get the that that statement about innocence at the at at the conclusion of that process, and it it it's a I suppose an extension of that point that I was making to Kenny that, you know, the beginning of truth, is to remove the lies, whether it's to do with Enniskillen, whether it's to do with Bala Murphy, whether it's to do with 1972 or 2022. I think that's our starting point. And, and Dennis, I'll ask you to say a few words on that, if you don't mind. No, well, I actually agree with Barney. You might. I think that they probably will come with it. Um, someone in Queens, I think, at the moment is doing a whole study about the effectiveness of apologies. Mm. The difficulty with apologies is that when you get enough of them, they run out of, you know, run out of heart. It's, you know, you feel that they've been written by somebody else. Formulaic, uh, you know, regret, uh, statements of uh, regret. I think I shouldn't. I read one the other day, funny enough, I was writing a bit of stuff and... Um, my introduction to the Troubles in many ways was a, was a man called Billy McGrenra from Derry, whom I had become friendly with. Billy was a very, very, very nice man. Didn't know him that well, but we liked each other in the short period of time that we got to know each other. And Billy got out of a car one night and uh, was shot by a soldier. But the British, the MOD issued a statement um, Actually, Frank Lagan, who was a big mentor of mine, who was the head of the RUC in Derry at the time, um, recommended that uh, he be prosecuted, that the soldier be prosecuted, but it didn't happen. Um, but Billy's family, Billy wasn't married, but Billy's family got an apology from the MOD, I think, about two years ago. So. You put that distance dragged out from nineteen seventy one yeah, yeah, to yeah. nineteen whatever it was two years ago, yeah. um, fifty years afterwards, stating very clearly that this was an innocent man, completely mm. innocent. He just got out of a car and just was shot. Now it might have been a young shoulder who was nervous and all that type of thing, but he still was shot. You see, so I, I wouldn't give up that they won't do it, but 
I'm not too sure it's a it's a great policy at this stage, you know, great mm -hmm. it's a great reconciliation at this stage yeah. because I think it runs out of uh, out of period and out of time. Of course. I saw another hand up. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thanks very much. Um what I'm gonna say is probably not gonna be very very popular with people, but I, I remember Dennis, I'd been in communication with you from time to time for it Yates truth recovery process. Um and basically I suppose I, I come from a different constituency um, of former combatants. We use the term former combatants rather than put labels on people because it's easier to have a conversation that way. And often you're talking to people from different traditions, loyalist, Republican, and indeed British Army. Um, and there are people who are willing to give information, mm -hmm. but they'll only give it uh, with immunity. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the British system. I'm talking a, a, a process of mediation and counseling with strict criteria, where if people are willing to come forward and give information that may be of help to the families and are willing to engage with families, if families wish to be engaged with, uh, then there should be a process for doing it. Not through the courts, you could have judicial oversight, but the is essential thing is that it'd be a bit like marriage counseling, if you like, or I'm not trying to belittle it, um, Marriage counseling, it could be industrial relations, which is the area I'm most familiar with. It could be business negotiation. But you have a system where there's someone to moderate the exchange. And if people come there in good faith uh, and are willing to be interrogated on what they know on all sides and come forward with uh, facts, come forward with what happened to the best of their knowledge, then there should be a way of facilitating that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require lawyers, it doesn't require politicians uh, to descend on us uh, like they. Um, and that's that's what we're looking for. Mm. We've had some engagement with the Northern Ireland Office, some engagement with the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, but not not very much. There's no appetite there for this. Their mindsets are very rigid, and that needs to change as well. But I'd just be interested to know what people think of the idea, particularly the Danes, but also mm. anyone else uh, you know who has a an opinion on it. So it's an informal way of achieving that it information, is, the question and answers that... It, it is, I mean, my best uh, example experiences of industrial relations. Yes. You go, you, you're in a, a dispute with the company. Mm. Uh, you're miles apart. Yeah, so yeah. you go to industrial relations. I, I've, I've got your point, you know. Dennis. Yeah, thanks for the question because it reminds me of something. I, I didn't come here the, this morning with this in mind, but I'm going to say it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm like everyone else around here. The only difference is that the consultative group in the past, the Eames Bradley situation, went out and did a major consultation for over a year. We talked to everybody who came to us, and they, a lot came, a lot didn't come, mm -hmm. but most came. And we went to every political party, we went to every aspect of society, and we listened. And we put a report together which said, this is how you do this type of thing. It's complex, but this is how you do it. Now, I'm not immune to society and to the changes and the and politics of, of, of what happened. So I have been through all kinds of changes myself. I got to a stage where I described what was happening in Northern Ireland around the past as that the, it, it was a swamp. There was no foundational ground. There was no firm ground on which one could stand to actually build stuff. So I modified my views to say, well, maybe if you can't do it that way, could we do it this way? Yeah, yeah. As, the, as the politics changed, as the situations changed. Do you know where I am now? <laughs> if you want to do this, do the consultative group in the past. Do the Eames Bradley. It is by far the best. It outstrips everything else. And it's doable. But you were shafted. Yeah, but so what? It's not the important thing that we were shafted. The issue was shafted. Yeah. Right? And I'm now saying, if this makes any sense, go back and do it. Mm. The reason that the guy who told me, who asked me to do it initially from the British side, mm. I tell the story that he came on a wet, cold, seven o'clock morning tea meeting in City of Derry Hotel. And I was on my way to Belfast, and he said to me, uh, would you do the past? An official? An official. 
Robert Hannigan, no. Robert Hannigan. Yeah. I, 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 now, the, the reason I mention Robert Hannigan Very is, important man. is because in that period, a bit like Julian Smith, who we heard from today, you had someone there who got this place and who was interested in making something And work. who went on to become yeah. head of... Spookery. Spookery. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember saying to Robert Hannigan, whom I liked, Yes. You are the worst diplomat I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Right? Because he wasn't one. Anybody who had <laughs> any wit would come with a bottle of whiskey at 8 o'clock <laughs> at night <laughs> and say, would you do the fast? But not on a cold, bleak, miserable morning on me on the way to Belfast. Anyway, after the report was done, I ran into Robert Hannigan. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I was after coming out from getting the ashes on a group on a Wednesday in Westminster Cathedral in London. Yeah. And I met him outside. Yeah. I don't know if he was a Catholic or Protestant or an atheist. I have still no idea. But we went for a couple He'd of hours. He'd have had an ash as well. Would he? Yes. All right, okay. okay. We went for a cup of coffee and he said I said, Look, Robert, you dumped me into this. <laughs> And you walked away. And you've never come looking. So we've met accidentally. Yeah. Which we did. Right? And he said, but Dennis, it's too dear. It's 300 million. Mm. Right? And he says, you will pay far more if you don't well, do it. Of course. Right? Yeah. But there should be no price on it then. The interesting thing is the reason that the consultative group in the past did not happen was because of the financial crisis that hit. That was the real reason. Brian Cowan was in bits. And Gordon Brown was in bits. The two most difficult meetings we had in the post period, right? Mm -hmm. when, when the thing was, was to go into a room with Brian Cowan and see how exhausted he was. And it was only made worse by going into a room with, with Gordon Brown and seeing how exhausted he was, right? People say that, they, that the, the consultative group in the past didn't happen because of the recommendation. That's well, nonsense. Well, the reconciliation. That doesn't the understand the policy. recognition payment. The recognition payment of 13000 to, to everybody, by the way, which is a good recommendation mm -hmm. and still should be brought back. Mm -hmm. But forget about that. That's not the reason it didn't happen. Mm. The reason it didn't happen was because the two governments were exhausted and the two governments were concerned about the collapse of their economies. Right? That's a real reason. It Not exhausted happen. by us, but with their own priorities. Their own priorities. Yeah, yeah. Right? And you could have sympathy for them at that particular time. Right? And the other reason it didn't happen, and this we, really mu we must acknowledge, is because our political parties, which you said earlier, could never agree on this issue. Mm. There is no way in a hundred years that we could get our political parties here to agree. I was on and, and I was the on second the new... thing that needs to be said, just to finalize mm. that, is that the victims in Northern Ireland will never agree mm. because they are two completely different narratives. Yeah. Right? So the two governments are the only people who have the authority and the wherewithal to actually bring this about. Yeah. If we're going to do it, it would be better done on a consultative group in the past, which, mm -hmm. by the way, recommends that it be done in five years. Of it's course. still doable in five years. Not that there should be an amnesty at the start. Yes. But there are mechanisms, and this was to answer your question, there were protected statements within our recommendation. There are protected statements whereby if you come in and you actually give information, that that statement cannot be actually used to prosecute you. Mm. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be prosecuted if somebody mm. finds evidence from somewhere else. All of that is within that context. Yeah. Sorry? Can, can, that is different. Yeah. Yes, Sorry. That is. I'm just, uh, Dennis, uh, I'm going to take one more question yeah. before we close this session. Yeah. Tim Atwood has his hand up. Thank you, Dennis, uh, for that contribution. I would agree. If we could turn the clock back to Eames Bradley, we'd be in a better place. But one point, the leadership that was there, there was honourable leadership at that time. And I, we now know there is an honourable leadership, especially within the British government at this time. And there's very few diplomats or uh, advisors behind the scenes that have the same level of influence on the British government, or the same level of partnership with the Irish diplomatic service as well. Could you, Dennis, you said earlier on that um, the, the, the bill in, in Westminster is basically appeasing the Conservatives' support of the veterans. 
is, and I know all parties are supporting, are opposed to the bill in Northern Ireland, but deep down, do you actually believe that even if you had a, a good process, that an honourable British government or Republicans or Loyalists will ever be willingly uh, uh, participate to tell the truth? Do you honestly believe that? Or is, is, are they actually, even though people are opposed to the bill, that privately they're happy? Because, let's be honest, they don't want the truth to come out. So many times people could have told the truth over the years on all sides, and it's too difficult. Not for, it may be difficult for the family, but it's too difficult for them because it shines a light on their past. And, you know, I, I, I appreciate your comments on that. Dennis. Well, the, your statement or your, your, your insight to the fact that that leadership probably doesn't exist or isn't available to us at this moment in time is probably correct. Uh, I think that there's a weariness within the political body politics around this issue. Um, so I think that governments are probably inclined, particularly the British government in its present state, will, 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 will go down that road. I mean, I listened in to the, I, I, I came across by accident, I think I was looking for one of the GA matches over the weekend and I came across a rerun of the parliamentary uh, inquiry recently within the House of Commons. Uh, and while everybody was being very upright and forthright and, and doing their best, it was nightmarish. Mm. It's nightmarish to listen to the detail and the, mm. and the because you know, people were seeing the trees, but nobody was seeing the forest. It's not that nobody was, that they, they weren't in a position to see, I'm not blaming people, but, 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 but that's terrible. The truth issue. I don't know that there's that much truth to be told anymore. I, well, when I say to be told, I mean indivi at individual levels, of course, there, there's truth to be told. But the overarching truth is mostly out there. There's no great secrets. I, I can't walk into a pub anywhere and people think that uh, the British are in some ways goodies within this situation. I can't walk into a group of loyalist community somewhere and think that they are a group of people or that they ever told the truth or ever will tell the truth. I think that, and I think that the main facts are kind of out there um, journalists will come across certain situations and more will come, but I don't, I think it's reasonably exposed. I think the skeletons are mostly out. Um, people will deny what the skeletons are. Of course, that's a different issue, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people still go on as if, you know, there was just individual bad people around this. I mean, governments made bad decisions around these types of situations as well. Mostly the British government, I think, but the Irish government made some bad ones as well. So I'm not, I wouldn't worry about that too much, about the truth. Um, I just think that, I think that you need some restoration of trust into this. It's how you, you get trust back into it. Otherwise, I think that we're facing into the situation of everybody just becoming weary of it and, mm. and, and, and it fading off. These conferences will happen now. In 10 years' time, there'll be less of them, and there'll be less people turning up at them. Of course. And I think that the people who are left with the hurt will, will turn up, and the politicians will, will walk elsewhere. And that's not good, but the real issue, and this is the one I, I was struggling to remember, two things. Let me, let me make two comments, because it's time we, we wrapped up. What strikes me about the bill, the present bill, is what the government are doing is saying, we're going to set up this group of people and we'll let them decide how it's going to run. I mean, I've never seen a bill as bad as that mm -hmm. uh, from, my, from a, a, a surfacey reading of it, right? But that's what it appears to be because there is no clarity within that bill about the procedures that are going to take place or how they take place. I can think of two ways. What if, if somebody comes in and there's an investigation going on? If there was to be an investigation and somebody comes in, say, I'm about to tell the truth here, I'm not going for an amnesty. Mm. Which comes first? Mm. There is no clarity within that bill around that. So all those procedures which they are claiming is actually going to bring this into being, you, you could question it all over the place. And mm. I'm, that's only a quick reading. 
a very quick reading from it. That, that's one. But you know the thing that really disturbs me in all of this is themes. The big, big part of the consultative group in the past was not just the concentration on individual cases. Themes and patterns. We need to know the themes, the themes, the truth. A lot of the truth lies in the themes. What happened around internment? Why did internment? Why was it introduced politically? Why did that happen? The, thing, the themes around republicanism and militant republicanism in Ireland, the themes around uh, genocide, which a lot of the unionist community around the border areas feel more, more hurt by, uh, and by the, the, by the neglect of the British, by the British government, they feel more hurt than the unionist community within the Belfast and the urban areas. There's a separation within that. There are massive themes that needs to be examined for our sake as a community, which brings us forward. And I don't see in any of the recent, uh, recent proposals the thematic strain, which was a major part of the consultative group in the past, which I don't think that you cannot get out of individual cases. You have to theme it. And yet it was, even in Stormont House Agreement, while it was there, it was... It wasn't quite as as, as, as important as, as I think as it, wasn't, it as wasn't as loud as it should have been. Anyway, De I've talked to you. Dennis, much. I think lunch is ready. Yes. Um, there'd be plenty of opportunity to discuss these things further this afternoon. Tim, I'll just say one thing. That the process that we should head into should not be a parade of shame. And we often talk about the IRA and the loyalists and security and intelligence. There are many more stories in our past uh, that takes those three or four or five groups into a much wider frame. I think when we deal with the past, we need to talk about the politics of this place. We need the media involved in terms of how we report conflict and peace. And we need many other people involved. Something happened to make the conflict happen. And we're all very comfortable talking about what happened and we're not so comfortable when we're asked to explore why it happened. But that's something we'll talk about later in the day. Dennis, thanks very much for joining us, for your contribution. Your memory's still very good. Uh, thanks. Your, your thinking's still very sharp and very sound. Thank you, Dennis.